Goodwin. And he is a senior manager at Wolfram Company's PC's Den Secure Group, where he is responsible for coordinating and ex executing cybersecurity assessment and services at client locations for financial, healthcare, educational, and investment planning clients. Sean also leads Wolf's PCI DSS team. Thank you. Here you go. All right, good morning. Um, thank you all for uh, not only being here, but sticking around for day two of the conference. It's always a little nerve wracking seeing you on day two. Um, so, quick shorthand before we get started you know, seven ways to frustrate attackers can mean a lot of different things. Uh, I'm curious just the general makeup of folks here. How many would classify themselves on the offensive side of security? A couple hands. Everyone else defensive? Yeah? Okay, so you're all saying, I'm sick of getting beat up by our pen test every year. I'm sick of seeing the news headlines, right? Um, okay. Um, so for the few of you that say you're on the offensive side um, of things, uh, I came up with this talk because I generally, um, truly believe we as defenders are winning. Um, and the narrative just tends to focus on the big headlines, and it's more exciting to talk about the big breaches versus the attacks that go unseen that are stopped. Uh, so a quick storyline here. So uh, like I said, I think we're winning, um, and this session is really meant to walk through uh, a real-world red team exercise. Uh, we can play a little bit of the Monday morning quarterback, uh, which is always uh, you know, a nice place to be safe. Uh, and just really pull out some of the things we can do as defenders to continue the trend of moving forward uh, and really start to win. So what we're going to do is walk through some of these real-world attack techniques uh, and then go through some examples of how you know, I believe we can continue to do a bit better. Um, so with that, just a, a quick bio. Uh, I've been consulting a little over a decade. Um, you know, really 
infrastructure is just a test, but what's interesting there is you know, a lot of folks will say, hey, we don't have the budget, right? Budget's difficult for everyone. We don't have the people, we don't have the tooling, um, you know, we need that. This organization is massive, right? Some of you folks may be a big organization, some of you are much smaller, right? The attackers can win regardless of budget size. So that, you know, we need to accept the fact that, okay, we're never going to necessarily have Like I said, absolutely the hardest one to implement uh, up front. But the idea of the point personas, uh, how many folks are familiar with honey pots? Any tokens? Yeah, a lot of folks. Great. How many folks are actually using them? A couple? Okay, excellent. Um, so the concept here is taking that and extending it beyond the machine um, to the actual recipient. You can do this in a, a wide uh, range of maturity and complexity, um, but you can 
start from a simple perspective and create some of these target email inboxes. You don't have to create you know, a lot of management behind that. What you want to do is set the message, uh, the inbox up to look like your legitimate email. So if you're using first name dot last name at company.com, you want to set that up with you know, something that looks real, right? Um, and then what you want to do is essentially plant these emails in places that attackers may pick up, but that won't really receive some examples of how you can do that is, uh, you know, burying them on the website so that when they're crawling the page, it's going to come up and it's not really presented as a real person. Um, another common one would be just commenting in the website itself, making it look like the developer left the email there. Hey, waiting for, you know, the answer from John Doe at company.com. Right? Planting it where no legitimate user is going to find it, but if someone's scraping the site to come up with target email list, it's probably going to get captured, rolled up. It's going to look like this isn't going to be your silver bullet. But what this is going to do is allow you to catch some of those you know, wide cast messages that may be trying to start some of that initial conversation to see who's going to reply to then be susceptible to that attack later on. Right? Um, and so with that, right, the, the more mature um, and really more complex is the full persona. And this is creating those socket. So from there, they did phishing, no one's really surprised, they got their foothold. Um, next thing they did, uh, ran Bloodhound. How many folks are familiar with Bloodhound? Yeah, okay. um, how many of them are using Bloodhound defensively? A couple, okay. Um, so number one, if you do nothing else right, let's get the support and read it. Number two, take a look at Bloodhound, um, especially before you have you know, a consultant and tester come in. They're going to use this, you can get ahead of them uh, and identifying a lot of weaknesses in your active directory environment. Now what the attackers did once they had that foothold, they ran Bloodhound, and what that's allowing them to do is enumerate the environments they're in. Like I said, this was a, a large, complex environment, so they wanted to figure out where do we land, what sort of access does this user computer have, where do we want to get to to move not only to the other sites, but to elevate our privileges, get access to more sensitive systems, etc. Uh, from a defender standpoint, like I said, you can use this and identify those same things. But also, the attackers are doing this. Um, this is an excellent detection opportunity for you because Bloodhound is noisy, right? And the way it's doing these uh, massive amounts of LDAP queries here. Uh, and Bloodhound is more powerful the more data that the attacker is able to ingest. So it's using the concept of a graph theory, right? So they're trying to enumerate all of the different properties in Active Directory. The more data they have, better chance you have to detect it. Uh, so on the bottom here, I highlighted out um, really great blog posts as far as how to detect some of these uh, enumerations. That again, this isn't necessarily, oh my God, you've been compromised, but hey, this is something we really should take a look at and start to investigate. Uh, the other thing you can do in here that will help make detection a bit easier is again, going back to that decoy approach and deception uh, capability and making some So they did blood down, they ran blood down, they gathered some information, and then they started to move throughout the environment. A lot of text there, uh, but really unconstrained delegation. So what they were able to do next was, uh, you know, probably to no one's surprise here, um, gain some access, and then go after the TGT. Uh, right, so TGT 
this point, <laughs> um, big trouble for the organization, right? So at this point, the attackers are able to uh, get access to the domain controller. Uh, they've got themselves uh, their golden ticket. So now, as they're moving throughout the environment, they're able to, if they don't have access to the system they're trying to get to, they're able to just request a ticket on behalf of an account that has access, and now they're granting themselves access everywhere within that domain. Um, so here, you know, I mentioned before, prevention is great, protection is must. Prevention is best case scenario here, because once they've gotten that, uh, really that, that domain has been compromised. So that attacker is able to impersonate anyone they want to in the environment. Um, so prevention, ideal, Microsoft, Important thing to note, though, is when you go in to rotate that ARVDT account password, you have to rotate it twice for the change to take effect. Um, and it doesn't matter what you set it to. Active Directory is going to change it in the background anyway, but you need to go through that password reset process two times for it to actually take effect. Again, from a protection standpoint here, um, you can flag um, some of this. Again, suspicious activity. Uh, you can filter out a lot of noise with some of the filter options there. Um, that's pulling from both the Microsoft blog post as well as uh, the AD security post is called out there as well. Uh, both of those are linked in the notes section for you. Um, and then the other big thing to note is PowerShell script block log. How many folks have that enabled in there? Right? One or two hands. A couple hands. Yeah, great. Um, th that's something that if if not, you likely have a very large what this is allowing you to do is actually log what's going on from a PowerShell perspective. And then when we're uh, looking down here, those event IDs are going to capture those Kerberos uh, ticket requests when they're coming from PowerShell. Again, maybe that's legitimate use in your environment, but it's also highly indicative of either an attacker or something, someone messing around with some of these attacker tools worthy of investigation. All right. So at this point, like I said, they've got the golden ticket. They're moving throughout the environment. Uh, and at this point, what they're doing is really trying to prove additional impact and continue to move outside of that first domain. I mentioned it's a really large organization, two different domains, uh, two different physical locations. They've got some other network controls to get around. And they started moving laterally through a few different things. DLL hijacking uh, and some WMI uh, event subscriptions here. Um, and then really what they started to do was um, started targeting legitimate users to try and hide some of their lateral movement, right? So maybe you are um, identifying, hey, Sean from accounting shouldn't be signing into the marketing machine. Maybe you're already that. But they were, again, they have the gold ticket, they're able to impersonate anyone they want. They're trying to be a little bit stealthy, which does make it uh, much more difficult to detect. It's also worth noting um, that there were uh, some SMB issues that have been disabled since 2016. Um, and I left that in intentionally because I'm sure no one here has any end of life systems in their environment, right? But some of these large organizations still struggle with getting rid of these and moving past those. I mean, I call that out because it's something a lot of folks are struggling with, uh, and we really need to be looking into how can we start to, uh, whether it's isolate those machines or additional controls because it is a widespread issue of dealing with end-of-life systems here. All right, so what can we do here? The first one uh, to call out is a tiered administrative strategy. Uh, folks haven't heard of that. This is extending the concept of, hey, you know, we have our IT folks, they've got their domain admin account, and then they've got their daily driver account. The daily account, you know, they can access the web, they can access email, et cetera. And then they have their domain admin account for doing domain admin things. Um, that was kind of the the V1 concept here. Uh, really what we're calling out with this is extending that not only to user accounts, but to machines as well. So no longer your IT admin is just low privileged user and domain admin, but you're going to extend that to, if you're gonna work on workstations, you've got a workstation admin account. You're gonna create that and restrict uh, that account so that it's only admin in the ODU for the workstations they should be working on. It's not gonna have server admin rights, it's certainly not gonna be a domain you split that out uh, by those different tiers. And that's really, you know, the, the common starting point is workstation servers, domain controllers. You can split this out however you want. It can be as complex as you want. 
uh, but really making sure folks are using the appropriate credentials on those appropriate machines. And what this is going to do is two things. From a prevention standpoint, if the attacker is already in your environment and they happen to hit you know, a machine, you're supporting an end user, you're having whatever issues they need some software installed, so you promote it in, your credentials are cached there. The attacker dumps those credentials. They're not moving up through the different tiers. Maybe they can still access other workstations, but they can't jump from your end user workstation to a domain controller in one hop. Right? So prevention, we can't get that. From a detection standpoint, they may not understand that you have these restrictions in place. And now all of a sudden, Sean workstation is trying to log in to DC01. And Sean knows this only works on workstations. That's interesting. Let's take a look at that. Um, Laps, uh, again, if folks haven't looked at that, um, hopefully no one here is using one local admin password across their environment, right? Microsoft makes it easy uh, for you to manage that for you. Now, the other thing to look at from a lateral movement perspective is you know, at the network level. Um, and there are a lot of you know, enterprise tools out there. I call out Security Engine because it's free and open source. You can start messing with it yourself. Uh, it has Sericata in there, which by default, has some pretty good detection capabilities for you from a lateral movement standpoint. Again, you're going to have to tune it, make it work in your environment, uh, but get you started off uh, a really good foot. And then the last one here is the concept of hardening your admin network. So I talked about we're going to split our user accounts out by these different tiers. The next step is actually doing that from a technology standpoint so that you're using essentially the concept of bashing those jump boxes from your admins. And then you can start to harden the endpoint firewalls to only allow some of that remote login activity from dedicated hosts or dedicated network segments. Again, it takes a little bit of work to set up, provides that preventive control of restricting logins, and then gives you yet another detection capability of why is this account trying to connect to another workstation from outside of the IT subnet, right? That's suspicious. Let's take a look. All right. So they're moving throughout the environment. Um, and at this point, um, they're able to jump between a few different sites. Um, and uh, again, I'm sure nobody here has this issue in their environment. The attackers happen to find credentials uh, in plain text files. So there were text files. Um, batch history had some passwords where you know, some admins uh, weren't where they thought they were uh, in the command prompt. Um, you know, folks had uh, credentials all over the place. There were some old scripts. Uh, from the IT department. Uh, again, no one here has this, uh, I'm sure. Uh, but again, users are going to do this for multiple reasons, right? The batch history, that's just you know, an admin making a mistake and maybe not thinking about, hey, I need to go ahead and make sure that that history is clear and that's not being saved, right? Um, the other thing is you know, the text file. Um, your users are not computers, right? So they're not going to be good at storing all these different passwords. And if you're not providing them with a secure way to manage all the different passwords they have to deal with, they're going to create a text file or a spreadsheet or a Word document. Um, if you haven't already, go start to hunt your network and find these. Um, and it's not a, hey, we're going to punish you because our acceptable use policy says you can't do this. It's, well, let's figure out why they're doing that and figure out how to help them do their job in a secure way. All right. So, um, Deception, again, comes in. A uh, common theme today is deception, right? Um, and so what we can do is start to plant. Okay, that's where the attackers are looking. Bash history, old script files, uh, you know, password stuff, TXT. Right? You can plant those around there um, and intentionally provide bad passwords. And what I like to do is not just create a random string of a bad password, but make it a pattern that if they find this six months, 12 months down the road, they can probably guess what the new iteration of it is. So fall 2023, two exclamation points. They find that in the spring. OK, maybe that's not going to work. You know, maybe it's spring or winter at this point. right? Make it something that the attacker um, is going to give you a better chance of catching them by taking a guess at what the password might be now. Right? And then what we can do um, from a uh, detection standpoint is, again, a specific event ID uh, with that filter on there. And what that's going to allow you to do is filter out the login attempts where the username is correct or the password is wrong. Um, this will likely create a lot of noise if you don't do any further filtering because Monday morning when your standard users come in, you know, a bunch of people.
equipment adapting or the best, right? So you want to filter out the noise um, and make sure you understand which accounts you've planted some of those decoy uh, credential files for and start to further alert off of those. And then again, punch your network. Your users, I guarantee, are doing this. Uh, something we see all over the place. Uh, unless you're providing them with a secure way to do this, they're going to find another way to store all the different passwords or maybe even worse, they're using the same password everywhere, right? So go out, find that, and then figure out a way to help them do their job securely. All right, so throughout all of this, the attackers obviously had to have some sort of command and control infrastructure set up to keep doing this. Um, Cobalt Strike and Merlin were the two uh, called out in the report that they were using. Uh, just like everyone else, you know, they use it because it works. Uh, but what was interesting here uh, really is that uh, you know, the attackers are working through here, um, and there was no detection on the C2 traffic itself. And that could be for a few different reasons. You know, it could be, hey, they're using the, you know, HTTPS profile, and we don't do, uh, you know, any web filtering. So it just looks like normal web traffic going on, uh, or anything else. Uh, two things to look at here. Uh, I called out Security Onion before. Again, uh, that could be really good. Uh, this first one on the left-hand side is uh, a white paper written by Dallas on specifically targeting C2 traffic in your environment. The other one that's really worth taking a look at if you haven't already is Rita. Um, so from Black Hills now maintained by Active Countermeasures. Um, and what I like about that is that's specifically built for detecting C2 activity. And what that's going to do is look at, uh, again, some low hanging fruit. So why is Sean's workstation connecting out to this web server every five minutes on the top? That's not normal user activity. That's suspicious. Let's take a look at it. Or why has Sean's workstation had an active session for eight hours? That's not normal uh, activity right at that website. That, you know, let's take a look at it. So there's a lot of uh, built-in detections for you. Um, and again, on the left-hand side, it's set up in minutes. Uh, if you've got the network um, data, the metadata that you take a look at, um, you can start hunting your network for some of this uh, as well. Now again, it's not going to be a silver bullet meeting every five minutes. But again, you'll be able to pick up some of the low hanging fruit here. All right. Um, the last thing I wanted to, to call out from an attacker perspective here is uh, auto -blocking. So you're never going to detect what you can't see. Uh, if you notice when I first brought up the report, I mentioned that there were 13 observable events throughout the whole red team engagement. Uh, there were only four that were either acted on or detected. And the fourth one there, it's kind of a, a gimme for the defenders. Um, the 13th action was simulated ransomware. They didn't actually encrypt any files. They placed the ransom note, and one user reported it. So we're giving them credit for that, right? They, they got close enough. Um, throughout all of these, I had a couple instances where uh, there were certain event IDs called out. But a lot of time when I've been talking with folks, you know, they're trying to figure out, there's a lot of things going on here. We don't even know where to start from a, an auto log perspective. We can't turn everything on because you know, our SIM bill is going to be $10 million a month. We can't, we can't do that. Um, so one of the things I like to point folks to um, is Malware Archaeology has their login cheat sheets. Has anyone heard of this before? No? Awesome. Um, so what they do here is um, on the right-hand side, they've got this, these free resources that they put out that are, they call them their login cheat sheets. And essentially what they do is they provide their own suggestions for how you should configure your auto policies. Uh, and what I like is the bottom two, they've mapped them back to MITRE ATT&CK. And what the concept there is, they're listing out all the different Windows event IDs, and then they're indicating which attack techniques that event ID provides coverage for, and they give you some stoplight score. So hey, is this really solid coverage of this technique? Or OK, you might catch it, but it's not going to really much, much information, right? It gives you some more context and helps you define some better uh, audit policies for your environment. Uh, this next one, real wallet text. All I wanted to do was call out, these are the 13 observable actions from uh, this red team engagement. We have the technique ID uh, from MITRE. And on the right hand side, almost every one of these has really good coverage from a Windows event ID perspective. There were a few that we talked about needing to have some network traffic analysis, which is expected. Uh, but overall, 
uh, in this specific environment, if they had auto log enabled and they had it tuned to actually be, we need to make sure the auto log is collected and analyzed, we could have turned that four actions being observed after the pump up to those 13 and ideally stop the attackers again before they, they were able to compromise everything. Um, so again, a lot of stuff in here, you know, I reference uh, external links and everything. Uh, grab the slides, everything is in the notes section uh, with the hyperlinks to everything out there. So with that, um, appreciate your time this morning. I know it was the last session before lunch, so uh, we have a couple minutes here for uh, any questions. Thank you.